Welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast by Scott L. Wyatt, President of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript for today's podcast. Hi again, everyone, and welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University. I'm your host, Steve Meredith, and I'm joined, as always, in studio by President Wyatt. Good morning, Scott. And good morning, Steve. It's it's always fun to be here. Today we're going to be joined in studio by a couple of guests that help foster the unique environment that is SUU. And one of the things that we do that that I think we do as well or better than anyone else in the country is our focus on project-based learning, and in particular the EDGE program. And uh, I'll let you introduce our guests, but uh, I'm very excited for this podcast. Well, thank you, Steve. And we've got two great scholars here with us today, and I'm going to start out with Todd Peterson. So, Dr. Peterson, um, you're the director of project-based learning. That's right. And uh, and uh, also... Uh, full professor of English, author. Indeed, many hats. <laughs> You've been doing project-based learning here for how long? We started the design work for the program we have in place now, the EDGE program, in 2010, if you can believe it. 2010, eight It's years. older than my youngest child. <laughs> and we also have Dr. Patrick Clark, who is um, one of our deans on campus. Patrick? It's good to be here. This is a new experience for me, and I'm really looking forward to talking about the EDGE program and project-based learning. So when we talk about SUU's project-based learning program, we call it EDGE. So what, what does EDGE stand for? Initially, we, like all good academics, we turned it into an acronym, and we thought that it should mean education designed to give experience. Um, there's a little bit of a backfire on that, which is we have a lot of people coming in with prior knowledge and learning, and they're like, what? You're going to give me experience? I've done two tours in Afghanistan. I've raised a family. I had a business. So we backed off that and started letting it be metaphorical and started asking the students to think about it metaphorical. So now what we hope EDGE means is that this is the um, education that you get that that means that you're on the edge of school and going into the world, or you're on the edge of what you know or the edge of your discipline and joining up with another one. And we've we've had a lot more value, I think, just thinking about edge meaning that. But we do like to tell the students when they're done, don't waltz into a place, uh, an interview, and say, I did an edge project. What we kind of counsel them on to tell the story is, when I was in college, I blank. And I then we this. want them to own that. Let's Let's talk about a couple terms. So we've got project-based learning that we're discussing. And then we also have a term that's known nationally, experiential or experience-based learning. Um, and, I, and I'm sensing there's really kind of a difference here. Um, experience-based learning is learning through doing. Project-based learning is what? And how would you... Can you give me an example of an experience-based learning that doesn't even come close to fitting what we're talking about in project-based learning. One thing that's really funny about this is that, um, so, so I serve on the board of directors for the National Society for Experiential Education. This is an organization that's been around for nearly 50 years. And they're asking this question now, how do we define experiential learning? After 50 years, they're finally saying, how do we define this? And as they are looking around the country and looking at each other, people are having a really hard time just defining what experiential learning is because there's so much that it entails. Um, is it just getting experience? Um, are there learning processes that are expected and are they articulated and are they, are they assessed? Um, and really, there are few people out there who have, who have tried to nail this thing down because it is kind of a, an open-ended discussion about what constitutes experiential learning. 
um, and who owns that. Project-based learning, on the other hand, from my perspective, is the student owns that. Um, and it's, it's process and developmental, uh, developmental in the way that it unfolds, uh, that it's not something that a student can step into and do effectively in a, in, a, in a relatively short period of time, that it takes maturity, it takes building on principles of, of, um, of self-evaluation and reflection and retooling as you go. Um, and that the end product is something that is um, the result of, of something that took a while to get there. Yeah, so um, I'm thinking of a possible good example, and that is let's say that I'm a biology student and, and I'm given lab assignments. And so I go into the lab and I, I do assignment one and two and three and four, and, and I have a great experience, and I'm learning from my hands-on experience. But that's not at all what we're talking about when we no. say project-based learning. We're right. talking about you write up your own experiment. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then step one is you have a good lab, and there's every reason to do that. The next step towards a more experiential model that we've learned from, again, working with this organization, Patrick has been talking about, NSEE, is the reflection. So when we talk about experiential learning, in the way that the practitioners mean it, they mean reflection on an experience. Um, and so that's the first step. But then when you jump over to project-based learning, that's when you use a model a lot like the formula we um, suggest to students just for making the declaration of their project. So we ask them to say, I want to do X in order to learn Y, which will help me to accomplish Z. So this is the student. This yeah. is my learning objective. Mm -hmm. my goal, not am, somebody else's goal. Right, I am trying I, to accomplish something. I want to learn this. Yeah. Therefore, I'm going to do this to accomplish that. They put together a proposal, and you're not going to tell them what their proposal is, and you're not going to tell them what they're going to learn. You're not going to tell them what they should care about. You're just going to tell them, what is it that you want to learn? And then, how are you going to learn it? And we'll help you. We'll help react to what you're doing, but we're not going to lead you. Exactly. Or we may say, I see what you're saying, but I raise you uh, this aspect right. of the project. Right. I see that you want to work on a children's book. What if you tried to at least publish a proof of it? So we, we, we're not passive when we work on this, but we say, there's, some, there's not as much clarity as we'd like in your objectives. And we use some language that we use in the institution. We ask them to state outcomes. And we have them formulate it um, this way in an if-then statement. If I accomplish blank, then something will happen. And then we ask them to come back and report on having moved that needle. What we don't tell them is that this is key performance indicators and <laughs> language <laughs> that they'd experience in the professional world. But, it, but they get to identify what those KPRs eyes are for themselves. Um, and um, then we ask them to come back and document that. So their proposal functions as a contract. This is what I said I was going to do. And then when they're finished with the project, we look at it and go, okay, did you do what you said you were going to do? This, if, com this comes in three parts. Yeah. Part one is the planning proposal stage. Part two is the actual carrying out of a project stage. And then part three is this reflection. Correct. We don't learn from experiences. We learn from reflecting on experiences. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's where the that's learning it. occurs. <laughs> and, it, and it's really a professional skill set. Um, so, I mean, I was in a, a meeting with Spencer Cox, our lieutenant governor, um, last summer. And, and he was talking about the current state of uh, the workforce in our nation. And it used to be that you went to college and got a degree and you plugged into a career field and that's where you stayed for 30, 35 years until you retired. But in today's world, um, our new professionals need to understand that it's likely that not only will they change jobs, but they may do uh, complete, they may do things that are completely different in 10 years after graduation um, from where they start after graduation. And they need to learn to retool, retrain, and learn over the course of their uh, professional life. 
and and really the edge program teaches some professional skill sets that aid that process it's not uncommon for individuals in their 30s and 40s and maybe even their 50s to have to learn new skills retrain retool and and do something that they never intended to do um, and uh, and and this process of reflection and thinking about um, about um, how they've accomplished things, how they improve things, how they learn uh, is, I think, vital to that process. Uh, it helps with the disequilibrium of doing something different and new. Let's talk about some of these projects. The most incredible one, in the sense of overwhelming, that I that I know of, was somebody that built a house for her project. Um, it was a tiny house uh, built on the back of a flatbed trailer. Um, I suppose that most students aren't quite that ambitious with their projects. But give us kind of a flavor of the range of projects students undertake. It, this is the best part of my job because when once we get out of the way, students constantly blow our minds and amaze us. Uh, this is the one that's on my mind the most. We have a student here at SUU who, prior to coming here to start down the pathway towards being a physician, she's coming here to do pre-med, she was a cello performance student at a conservatory, and she had a change of heart. And so she got here and got started going uh, in the direction that she needed to become a physician and said, you know what, I do not accept that I will not get to do a senior recital anymore, so I'm going to do one anyway. So she's planning and arranging and practicing or rehearsing for a senior recital that she would have had if she finished the conservatory, but that she wants to still have as a completed experience for herself as she launches in to become a doctor. Well, in, in talking to her about this project, I said, not only are you satisfying a personal passion, you're being really wise because medical schools are changing fundamentally what they want to see and the breadth of the kinds of people that they bring in. So when we go talk to um, the folks at the rural health scholars, they keep saying medical schools are really interested in seeing people who have a human side to themselves. That they've done some work in the arts or in the humanities that they can read deeply and that they're empathetic. And so this project is deeply personal for the student, but it's going to be wildly successful for her. And it just shows something about who she is as a person and what her moxie is. So that can be one kind of a project. Um, on the other side, we have people, again, who build a tiny home. We had a student, uh, a number of students who used their EDGE project to start working on the development of a child care facility on campus um, where they saw a need. They joined in and participated in the community and got involved in something that maybe in some ways whisked them away and became a larger project than they thought about. Um, some students use it to complete a project that school has really taken their attention off. I, we get a lot of people who want to finish writing a book that they just have been dabbling at, but they need something that focuses on them uh, to finish that. Um, we had one student that we did one of our awards for last year. Um, she is a Native American woman who um, joined up and went through a women in firefighting training program to become a wildland firefighter. And this had used that to uh, attain the credentials and to start doing the internship work. And now she's kind of moving into a place where um, women of color aren't commonly found. But she have found her way into that and, and again, gained a lot of personal confidence about being able to work and function in that world um, and to maybe even be a little bit of a pioneer. So some of these projects are really, really quiet and personal, and some of these things are really out in the forefront um, and are really kind of showpieces. And, and some are just um, fairly directed towards their career, like the student that did a windmill to charge up his cell phone. Right, wants to be an engineer, just yeah. wanted to um, do that. And we think that the honoring the entire spectrum of students' reasons for wanting to do this is really important than saying, nope, you need to do the reasons we want you to do. And we, we, we've learned a lot. I guess that's I've learned a lot in the last seven years of doing this about how complex and varied students' reasons for being in college are. 
The thing that I really liked about the student who built the windmill is something that he said that really um, really resonated with me was, I wanted to design something that was my design and not something that my professor wanted me to design. Uh, I had this idea and I just couldn't really find how this fit into my uh, my program of study, but the EDGE program opened up this opportunity for me, so I was able to exercise what's been kind of cooking in my own mind uh, and, and building something of my own design. And, and part of it, real quickly, one of my favorite projects, which is something that's kind of under the radar, but I, I just love it so much, is there was a single father who... Um, really struggled with the idea of, of coming up with a project until he realized that um, it, it could be something that was, as Todd said, very personal to him and um, really served a need in his neighborhood. And so what he did is he organized um, a clinic to help other single fathers with daughters learn how to do their hair. Yes. <laughs> because they, a lot of single fathers have young daughters who need their hairs done in the morning before they go to school. Uh, he struggled with that, and it was hard for him um, to know how to braid hair and curl hair and do things like that. But he, he, So in doing this project, he was able to demonstrate leadership skills, organizational skills, that he was able to learn a new skill set. Um, and none of this would have happened unless there was something in place to really motivate the process. And so it's kind of one of those under the radar projects, but there's so much that you can tell about an individual or they can tell about themselves and they share their story about why they did it, what they learned from the experience, who it helped. Um, and those are just dimensions that a lot of our students don't think about early on, but after they complete this process, they're better able to talk about these things and communicate to other people these stories I think that make a big difference when they're trying to um, um, when they're trying to compete <laughs> with other people in the job market. Well, so when I'm an employer and I'm doing interviews and I go through everybody that's that's um, done great in the college, and then I come across somebody who um, shows some real initiative to figuring out a problem, and then creating a strategy, implementing it. That really sets that person apart. This is what you talked about when you referred to the heart research uh, yeah. work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's some emergent research. Clemson has worked on this, and I don't know if they've published it yet. But they ha um, took a bunch of seniors that were getting ready to graduate, divided them into some groups. They um, had them do mock interviews on campus with um, faculty and staff that were professionals in those areas. And they did this standard way. They took one group and didn't prep them at all. They took one group and ran them through career services and had them get kind of ready for mock interviews. And then they took one group and that got them ready through career services and then had them make a portfolio. Just assemble the stuff. They never showed the portfolio to anyone. They never showed the portfolio in the um, interview. But the act of of synthesizing material to create a portfolio made them head and shoulders better interviewers. And so that's another aspect mm -hmm. of this, the, the ability to do something and then reflect, to organize it, synthesize it, put together the information that just might, you know, for all intents and purposes, may be useful in a portfolio. The higher utility may not even be in the artifact created, but just in the process of curating materials to talk about what you did, and then to maybe have a run-through and a practice on talking about what you did to achieve those results so that when you sit down to be interviewed, you're coherent, you've thought about this kind of stuff, and you're not really kind of talking on the fly. So a lot of this is just about having practice at a thing that professionals know that they have to do over and over and over and over again in their lives uh, in order to advance and to get where they are to move from one job to another, one career to another. Um, and this seems to be the starting point. So if they can repeat these processes, what we hope is that they can do this with any project, with it, whether it's professional or personal, um, whether it's something they're using to serve uh, in the community, this can be repeated. This has a real occupational feel to it, but it's way beyond occupational feel. This is... Uh, this is the kind of character, discipline, personal reflection 
that, that we want students to gain, the yeah. intrinsic value of education, not just the utility. And it, it serves both purposes, doesn't it? It does. Well, well, so the tradition of higher education in America has been to lecture, to read, to respond. Um, and then it evolved into labs and work projects. And this seems like the next um, iteration, which builds on the former two, which is just kind of the passive learning and then converting it into active learning or experiential learning, and then going well beyond that into guided learning, um, where the student is learning on her own with a lot of support. But as you said, what does she want to learn, and how is she going to learn it, and how is she going to measure that she learned it? What a phenomenal preparation for life. Um, this is an exciting uh, frontier. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for having us. Thanks for listening to Solutions for Higher Education. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript of today's podcast. The original music for this podcast was composed by Jack Barton, a master's degree student in music technology at SUU. For more information about Southern Utah University, please visit www.suu.edu.